if I were to come up and be the Republican nominee or Democrat nominee, whatever, I would say, okay, look how much eggs cost right now. Look how bad inflation was this past year. I think it was like 14%, something crazy. Tom, it sounds like you're running the Republicans somewhat failed campaign of 2022. I mean, like, oh, what? Eggs are expensive. Inflation. Vote for us. No. Like, what? No. Well, OK, what would you do? All right. Welcome back to the Loopcast, Catholic Boat's weekly rundown of all things faith, culture, and politics. If you're new here, make sure to hit subscribe, turn on notifications. With that being said, let's get right into it. 2024 is heating up. It's no secret. We see each hopeful kind of doing different things at this point. We have Biden overseas in Ukraine. We have Trump in Ohio coming up this week. And then we also have DeSantis, who hasn't announced his run yet, making some trips to Long Island, to Chicago, and to Philly. So, Josh, you're kind of a politics nerd. It's no secret at this point. What do you think all those people said? And, and I have to mention, what are your thoughts on Nikki Haley? Ooh. Well, she did announce this week that she's running for president. And I think, um, you know, she's got the defense industry on her side because she's a, very much a strong supporter of America going to war. Um, and so uh, I'm not a big fan of Nikki Haley myself. She she made a comment right after the whole George Floyd, uh, you know, his death and the subsequent riot. She said that it needed to uh, it needed to be painful and personal for a lot of Americans. And I think a lot of Americans are thinking to themselves, um, you know, obviously justice needs to be served in this case, but why should it be painful and personal? So it just feels like she rides the wave of a lot of political correctness, I think. So uh, I think people are going to definitely, you know, I think as uh, Catholics and other uh, conservatives and Christians look at the race, uh, I mean, they'll certainly give her a look, but I think she's going to face some scrutiny for some of her past positions. Um, but when you mentioned Trump going to Ohio, it's not just that he went to Ohio. I think he was very clever. Trump, you know, went to East Palestine, uh, Ohio, where the site of the train uh, accident, and he was, you know, trying to raise the emphasis there um, and, and contrast that with Biden going to the Ukraine. Uh, Biden went to Ukraine before he came to Ohio. I mean, mm -hmm. where, the, where that disaster was. So I think that's a good contrast for Trump. Uh, it's a lot better for him to focus on stuff like that uh, than to be basically screaming on his own little uh, Twitter uh, redux, whatever you call it, true social thing. True social. Uh, like the extent that he completely whines about the 2020 election and doesn't focus on the future, that's not good. When he's doing stuff like this, where he's going to Ohio to, to paint that contrast, that's good. That's very good for him to do that. And I hope he does more of that because yeah. uh, that it's actually value added. Right. But it's interesting the way the race is shaking up. I think we pretty much, I mean, everyone just assumes that Donald Trump, because he was a former president, he's the front runner. But I'm here to tell you today that that's actually not the case. Uh, Ron DeSantis is the front runner, and I'll tell you why. It's not uh, it's not my decision on this. It's that you can always tell who is the front runner by who the other candidates who want to be the presidential candidate are attacking. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So in this last week, we saw South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem attack Ron DeSantis. We saw former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan attack Ron DeSantis. And we saw New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu attack Ron DeSantis. All these three candidates are considered themselves, you know, potential candidates for president uh, in 2024 as a Republican candidate. And of course, Trump has been attacking Ron DeSantis for months now. So you, you, you start to think like, wait a minute now, is it really the case that Trump is the, the front runner? I think actually it's pretty obvious now that Ron DeSantis is a slight front runner because the people who are wanting to become the nominee are attacking the guy they think is in the, in the top position. They got to get them off that pedestal so that they can be the number one candidate. So who hasn't even you know, I just look at the reactions of what people are doing. They're all they're all attacking a guy who hasn't even announced for pregnant for or hasn't <laughs> announced for pre not pregnancy. Jeez. Not pregnancy. Well, Ron, yeah. Ron DeSantis yeah. is not pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. No. Not yeah pregnant. Definitely no. not. No announcements. He's not pregnant, but uh, yes, he hasn't even announced his presidency yet. Because men and can't so get to pregnant. see so many people. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just thought I'd insert to see so that. many people attack a guy who hasn't even announced yet. I think makes it pretty obvious who the front runner is. And I think to dive deeper well, to what he's not, been doing on its own is not enough. Right. I mean, well, just correct. the fact, if there's a few attacks here and there, but 
Correct. The fact that all of these candidates are attacking Ron DeSantis, it makes it pretty clear that he's the he's the top dog right now, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to dive deeper, and like, so if we want to paint the picture here, all of the front runners were doing something different. What what Ron DeSantis chose to do in that time was to go visit Staten Island, to go visit Chicago, and go visit Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. What all those places have in in common is that crime, violent crime specifically, has been up substantially in those places. Right, going there and making the pitch, saying, "Hey." In Florida, we treat our officers with respect. We'll give you a bonus to come down to Florida. But not everyone can come to Florida, but we need to see this kind of change in the country. So do you think his pitch to law enforcement is seen as authentic and passes the smell test, I guess, for most of the country at this point? I mean, everyone knows that Ron DeSantis is doing that because it's basically using his office as you know governor, a, a legitimate purpose. He is actually trying to get people from the Chicago Police Department to move down to Florida. Lots of them have. Mm -hmm. And also, as you say, Philadelphia, New York. But it's running for president without having to actually run for president. Yeah. So, I mean, this is not the first time this has been done. I mean, people have to, I mean, this kind of stuff happens all the time. Uh, but he's he's doing it in a very ingenious way. Yeah, I said this to yeah. Tom before the show. I was like, tell me you're running for president without saying you're running for president. And that's pretty much what happens there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Donald Trump made the actual announcement to run for president again, and he did it very early. And his intention for doing it was to try to, you know, scare anyone else from running in, in, in the race. That hasn't happened so far yet. I mean, you know, Nikki Haley decided to toss her hat in the ring. The question is, is she actually running for president or is she just running to be the vice president under one of the other people running? Yeah. You know, she's going to have to convince people that she's got enough of a campaign, enough of a message, and, you know, and money. So to, to be able to you know, put together a national campaign um, I mean, the same goes for, I mean, you know, some of these candidates, I mean, I think it's kind of funny, Larry Hogan. I mean, he's a super liberal, former governor of Maryland. Like there's, there's no constituency for him amongst Republican party voters, but he'll run for president anyway. You know why? He wants to make money, right? Right. He wants to, you know, he'll write a book mm -hmm. and he'll get, he'll become a CNN correspondent right. or, you know, commentator or whatever. I mean, he's not actually running for president. And, Half these people aren't even going to be running for president. They're just like getting their name out there to sell books or get a TV show or become right. a, you know, a Fox News celebrity. But in the case of Larry Hogan, it's to be on MSNBC or CNN because right. and, you know, and there's, there's something to be said for the, the liberal media loves to have to, to pay money to a so-called Republican that will just bash every I mean, conservative idea that's ever come at, down the pike. Look at Adam Kinzinger, right? I mean, he cashed out in CNN. He's a never-Trumper. Yeah. I mean, he just made his money off of hating Trump. Right. Mm -hmm. And Alyssa Farah from The View. Those people are all distractions, right? Let's put them aside. Let's talk about the real contenders here. So one president, the former president, is visiting East Palestine. This is before President Biden has even been there. I think what a lot of people have brought up and what he has himself talked about is that FEMA was actually denied. So this type of disaster aid was denied to this area of Ohio right after it happened. It was said, this doesn't qualify under a natural disaster. Right. Yada, yada, yada. As soon as Trump announces that he's going there, FEMA says, oh, actually, no, we're going to provide some aid. And Trump, of course, has jumped on that, which is smart. <laughs> I mean, in one sense, I can understand that like it's not a natural disaster like a hurricane. So I can kind of understand that. It's a disaster. It, you're totally right that as soon as Trump announced he was going there, oh, they, they made a like, 180 and they realized this is bad news for us. We're sending yeah, a rat. What does that, what does that was, reveal? That just reveals that it's, it's political games, right? I mean, you say, okay, maybe it's not a natural disaster, but the fact that they could just flip all of a sudden is it threatens them. It's like, okay, yeah, no see, female applies. It was such bad optics. See, it was such bad horrible. optics did, for him. Yeah. Did you see the meme that Senator Rand Paul sent out, you know, right after Ohio got its That's a sentence. Uh, request denied with all this aid? Uh, there's this picture and it showed the uh, Ohio governor <laughs> and then a cutout of, his, of Zelensky's face <laughs> over his face. Yeah. And yeah. It's like, maybe Ohio, maybe Biden will send money to Ohio now if we convince him it's really the... Yeah. the the Ukraine, so it was right. pretty Well, funny. and something else DeSantis did on his tour, he had to stop at Old Fox and Friends, and um, he actually started to, he, he made a statement about the way that President Biden has been approaching the Ukraine, and he was very critical of what he termed the blank check policy uh, with no clear strategic objective about the Biden administration. Then he went on to say, Americans don't want a proxy war with China. So can I pose a question that I think a lot of Catholics specifically have had? And, you know, the America magazines of the Catholic world have made their case on it. But Ukraine, right? W what is the 
what should a Catholic think about the situation in Ukraine? We're a year deep at this point. There's some people that are like, oh my gosh, we absolutely need to support monetarily, militarily, boots on the ground in Ukraine right now. It's the right thing to do. It's, it's the Catholic thing to do. And then there's another camp of people who are like, I want nothing to do with Ukraine. You know, there's parts of Russia that are like, we don't understand Eastern culture. We don't understand that conflict at all. There's corruption on both sides. So what's a prudential way to think about this matter? And what are both sides presenting as, you know, the way forward? So I think with the blank, I'll go with the blank check Catholics sort of on the first extreme to start with. The the temptation with that, as with like amnesty for illegal immigration and all that, the temptation there is that Catholics start to think that the most charitable, the most compassionate response we can have as Americans with Ukraine is to just give them the blank check and continue to fight against the oppressor um, in any way that we can. I don't think that that's applying our prudential judgment and our critical thinking that there are other ways. There's nothing compassionate about not having an exit strategy and about saying, okay, America, we're just going to drain American resources in order to support this war over there. I think there has to be a lot more nuance to the way that we think about it than just the blank check approach. Yeah, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the Iraq war in that we went in there gung-ho, pumped up, throwing Americans in the mix, and we leave, you know, 10, 12 years later, completely depleted. Or Afghanistan. Americans died over there. We leave with yeah. nothing. Afghanistan is, is what I meant, rather. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And it's reminiscent in that, like, if we're pro- prolonging conflicts like this, to which there really is no end, it, it doesn't really leave with any meaningful change. And so the, yeah. I think the blank check strategy does kind of exacerbate, like, oh, whatever it takes. Like, to be honest, would you be oh. willing to send your sons overseas right now in well, a conflict I only that have we're one, not involved so in? No. I'm gonna answer the answer to that is no for me. I mean, I'm not willing to put American boots on the ground and I don't know, does that make me a bad person? Does that mean bad Catholic? I don't know. Yeah, in five years my son would be old enough to to fight, you know, if there's something happened in the Ukraine. And I, I absolutely don't want my son to go to the Ukraine. The thing is, you see changes in political parties over time, right? So the, the most recent memory with regards to like war is, as you said, Afghanistan and Iraq, because of George W. Bush, people started to associate Republicans with being pro-military. Which we are pro, we are pro people who serve in the military, certainly, but that still remains the case. But they assumed that Republicans were the ones that were in, interventionists. And they wanted to go start wars in foreign countries, right? Well, Actually, you know, Donald Trump's nomination in 2016, he, he, as he's running for the nomination, he was slamming that every turn. And a lot of Republicans were still like, well, wait a minute now, because they were just so used to defending what George W. Bush did for so long. And Trump just kept hammering in that. And actually, so I give Trump a lot of credit for that because he's, he was returning the Republican Party more towards a skepticism of overseas adventurism in, in military conflicts. Uh, it was kind of funny. Someone started this on a little a ru- a Russell on uh, Twitter a few days ago. Good guy. He's like, well, I don't understand. I mean, I don't understand how Republicans and conservatives now are so against interventionist wars. It seems like a very new thing because he's remembering, right, the er- early part of the George W. Bush administrations where we're just after post nine eleven war after war. After war. Mm-hmm. Right. I said, actually, you know, listen, it was. It was, uh, you know, Bob Dole ran for president, vice president in 1976, right? He was Ford's nomi- uh, vice presidential nominee, and he was criticized for saying this. He, he said he, he attacked the Democrat wars, uh, meaning World War II and Korea, and he was denounced for this, mm-hmm. uh, but the, and Vietnam too. And the idea was, you know, he said if you could take all the dead from these Democrat wars and fill the city of Detroit. I mean, it was just amazing. And so, like, you start looking at the history, like Taft and some of these, they were, they were called, uh, intervent- they were called um, isolationists because they weren't in favor of certain wars. Now, I'm not saying I'm against all wars. I think World War II is justified, okay? And look, you know, Korea, you know, Vietnam, maybe not so much a, a, a good idea. But certainly Afghanistan and Iraq, I think a lot of people woke, saw their eyes open and realized we're getting ourselves way overextended here. And so, you know, 
you know, Joe Biden is basically saying, as you say, just like keep whatever Ukraine wants. We're apparently just going to give them an unlimited supply of cash right. and weapons. I guess the rationale behind this, which is never really stated publicly, is that you want to try to drain the treasury of Russia and just just get them bogged down there like we were in Afghanistan, like Russia was in Afghanistan in the 1980s. So that's maybe what they're trying to do. But like, I don't know, is that a good policy? Do, do we really want Russia more impoverished? Mm -hmm. You know, so I-, I yeah. And I'm we're dependent on China now too. What's China throwing here? its hat into the ring. We're not just talking about draining Russia. We're also talking about leaving a vacuum that will be filled and it will be filled. Apparently at this point, it looks like China. So I yeah, think and that's what I'm just, skeptical about that. I, I think I think China's going to ultimately kind of hold off, but, but I, we'll see. So I just wanted to bring up the point too. I don't think there's anything charitable or uh, prudential about starting a nuclear war, and specifically by President Biden going to Ukraine in Ukraine a year on the anniversary, knowing that Russia would be upset about that, kind of throwing a middle finger their way. It just doesn't really make sense to me to try to push. You know, why are we pushing dogs to get desperate? It's imprudent, but I don't think Putin's going to launch ICBMs over it. Right. But even so, why are we like even the threat of a nuclear don't poke war? The bear, right? Right. Don't, don't poke, poke the, bear. the bear. So, yeah. I don't know. Like, there, it's a very complex, it's very nuanced. But all of that aside, I think a winning strategy for someone right now, if I were to come up and be the Republican nominee or Democrat nominee, whatever, I would say, okay, look how much eggs cost right now. Look how bad inflation was this past year. Things like 14%, something crazy. Uh, you can't afford to live. Uh, and the current president, guess what he's doing right now? He's overseas. And how much money have we spent overseas this past year that could have been spent, I don't know, fixing yeah. our railways now that oh, there's all these accidents? Tom, you sound like you're running the Republicans' <laughs> somewhat <laughs> failed campaign of 2022. Oh, uh, I mean, like, ouch. <laughs> what? Eggs are expensive. Inflation. Vote for us. No. Like, what? No. Well, okay, People what would care. you do? Pe People... People are, we're now at a point where we're almost everyone is culture voters, left and right and center. And so what you need to do is respond to those questions. You know, you don't run from, I'm not saying you are running from it, but a lot of Republicans are like, we don't want to talk about abortion. I take that we don't personal. Want to talk about, I talk we don't want to talk about <laughs> Ukraine. We, don't, we want to talk about how eggs are expensive and that's why you need to vote Republican. Like it's not working, okay? So talk about the issues that I think you know, really touch the human heart. Like, hey, what do we think our country should be like? What should we be teaching our children in schools? Like, should we be, should, should we be pushing this kind of radical transgender ideology that's convincing, you know, thousands and thousands of children to have their bodies mutilated? Like, those are the things that we need to start talking about. Like, I mean, I don't think we move the needle that much by saying, eggs are expensive. Like, of course they're expensive. I mean, like, it sucks. Yeah, sure. But like, you know, now, interestingly enough, I do think Donald Trump in 2016 benefited by being anti-war and Hillary Clinton was very pro-war. And so I do think uh, it, it matters. And this is why it matters. So like I am in Michigan in 2016, Trump won Michigan by a sliver. There were 73,000 Democrats who filled out their ballot. And then when it got to the top of the ballot, they just couldn't do it. They couldn't vote for Hillary. So they left it blank or they voted for Jill Stein or whatever. And so Trump was able to win by almost just, you know, like, because the other party just like, I can't do it. I can't do this. There's, I just, he's, she's too far gone on the pro, pro war stuff and corporate and stuff. So, um, you know, I do think these issues matter. I think it, it is good that the Republican party is being, uh, much more responsible and pragmatic and less interventionist than they were. And that's I think okay. that's DeSantis's strength too, is that yeah. he's just getting stuff both done. Both DeSantis and Trump. And Trump is yeah. recognized. Both of them credit correct. on this one. They both just get the stuff done. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about, by, in the Biden administration, about we're going to save this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to, all these big SWAT things, whereas Trump and DeSantis in Florida, he's just, He's building, he's compiling this body of evidence that he's just going to get stuff done. 
And I think that's very oh, I attractive. See what you're saying. I thought you were talking about the foreign policy stuff yeah. first. Yeah, no, like in terms of getting that stuff too. legislatively, that too, it's like but, a no-brainer. Right. DeSantis is on the front t- talking about culture of voters, Josh. DeSantis yeah. is putting himself on that front by getting stuff done, not by going out and talking about it, but by, you know, hiring people from Hillsdale to revamp the Florida uh, State University system yeah. by adopting, you know, CLT possibly by rejecting transgender in the schools and taking out books from schools like he's on it he's he's positioning himself by taking action and i think that's a winning strategy in market contrast to our current secretary of uh, transportation pete blue judge who took two months off for (laughs) paternity leave (laughs) you just said his name yep here we go yeah and 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 then you look at the train derailment in ohio and several others across the country and like bridges you know are just in a state and it's like didn't we pass a trillion dollar infrastructure bill to help with this yes and you look then at what happened at the hurricane that hit florida and governor DeSantis and his team was able to construct a a bridge like in three days Mm -hmm. get needed supplies to this people that were you know on an island they couldn't get it to it and you're just like wow so, like, that's a that's an example where people, I think, would just welcome competency. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, my gosh, we're getting things done. Like, I think the American people sort of just understand all, most politicians are crooks and criminals and they only care about themselves. But if you can actually deliver for me and my family and just get the job done, then I'm I'm going to be a lot happier because I know you guys are all clowns. Yeah. yeah. But at least you're you're not robbing me blind. That would be great. And not to psychologize yeah. it too much. But I am looking at the sort of American obsession with father abandonment and, you know, how people have this like absentee father thing going on in our in our culture. Yeah. And there's Biden off that in Ukraine so and Pete Buttigieg off at G7 whatever summits. And they're talking about, you know, not about people who are in trouble. Man Meanwhile, up show up. DeSantis yeah. is yeah. like showing up in Chicago and showing up in Staten Island and talking to the policemen saying, yeah, you've had the rug pulled out from under you. Come work for me. Daddy will take care of you. I mean, that's a very powerful message for Americans. So daddy's home. He's going to take care of us. <laughs> I'm going to vote for the, the present father rather than the absentee father. I'm all about this. Let's psychologize it. Yeah, I think... Uh... That reminds me too. Oh, that's interesting. I'll say that. Yeah, there yeah. you go. I, I'm married to a psychology professor. What can I say? You know. Yeah, and and a lot <laughs> can change. A lot, a lot can definitely change. Like at this point, in 26 or 2015, I believe Trump had like a couple percentage points, maybe less of the vote. So you know, a couple events could really mean long all way the to difference. Go. We'll long see what happens. Go. We got a long way to go, but they're just warming up. They're warming up for the race. Okay. Now that we're done with that conversation, wanted to add, please. Pray for the repose of the soul of Auxiliary Bishop O'Connell in Los Angeles. He tragically was what appears to be a murder investigation. Uh, not all the details are super clear, but by all accounts, a really holy man, someone who loved his community deeply, and just a really tragic, unfortunate situation. So we could all just lift, lift him up in prayer this week. I know it will be really appreciated by the community over there, and hopefully justice is served in that situation. I was so moved. By this, you know, I'm I'm not here to endorse TikTok, right? But this was the the medium of the message on this one. So I thought I would get it and show it to you guys. Essentially, it is a recording, a self recording of someone, a video they posted on TikTok about how their grandma responded to them wanting to be called a a certain name. They they had uh, seeming they uh, publicly changed their gender and name or tried to, and they wanted their grandmother, who clearly was Catholic, to uh, to respect sign that, off on that. Mm-hmm. sign off on it. And so we have the response here and I was just blown away by how beautiful response this is. Here it goes. We'll play. So recently I texted my parents because I'm going to go be- go home for Christmas. And I said, Hey, do you mind calling me Mike when I come back for Christmas? And then when I got home today, I got this letter from my grandma and it is addressed to miss old name. Not actually, but you know, I don't want to say my real name on the internet. Dearest dead name. On this, our blessed mother's feast day, I am writing to tell you that I will not address you as Mike. My decision is probably not a surprise to you. Others may comply with your request. My anguish in your chosen name and what that means has to do with your eternal soul. Know that I love you more than words could ever possibly convey to you. No matter how you decide to identify yourself does not change my deep love for you, honey. 
Because of my concerns for your soul and your mental health, I am spending more time with Jesus in adoration. The, my cousin's last names, are doing the same for you. Um, then she lists my one, two, three, four, five cousins that are below the age of ten, who are apparently, um, offering up special personal sacrifices for me, who I didn't tell, um, that I wanted to go by Mike. I didn't want to. I haven't talked with your godmother and her family, but I'm sure they would do the same for you. Do you know how much you are cherished and loved? It would be a joy to see you and be with you during the coming Christmas. Um, I was starting to know what's stuff. It's um, like, I mean, it's not the, it's not the uh, archetypal 1950s grandma that was shouting and screaming at the teenager, like in Sidney Lauper's music videos or Madonna, you know, Papa Don't Preach. It actually felt like it came from a place of true love and respect. And it was as if her grandmother was speaking in ancient Greek. She could not really even fathom what was going on. Yeah, I think the heartbreaking part for me listening to it was that clearly this girl was reading it as if it was a bad thing that happened to her that it was the wrong response for her grandmother to say this, obviously. Like, she's going to call me dead name. I didn't want my cousins to know my eternal soul. Like, she couldn't even say the words, like, our Lord. And I, yeah, my heart just breaks for this girl. But so much respect for the grandmother, whose heart must also just be torn into to have a faith and to see the beauty uh, that God has created us for and to love our Lord so much and then to watch your grandchild go through this um, and just must be the, the greatest pain, you know. Yeah. Um, but again, I think it's 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 noteworthy that the grandmother wasn't calling her a sinner no, or screaming at her. said, I love you. I'd I love to see you at Christmas. I do think that's something that we've learned, you know, over the last 40, 50 years. I think like 40 or 50 years ago, the thought was, Hey, I, if I yell at you and shame you and wag my finger, that maybe you'll snap in, you know, in line. Uh, that proved to be a not successful way of evangelizing Absolutely. and teaching our children of the right way. So, yeah, I uh, could ask the grandmother to really just show uh, some heart. You know, I just loved when multiple times throughout is, do you know how much you're cherished and loved? And What's beautiful about that was not only obviously from her grandma by how she wrote that card and how she's excited to see her on Christmas and but also because she's cherished and loved by God. And I just think what really makes me sad about the situation is if we were able to educate our children with that understanding of being cherished and loved and, and understanding their faith and understanding how they were made then she would already have the vocabulary and perception to understand those things. But unfortunately, clearly, she was either educated or received most of her influence from the internet or from her public school or even her private school mm -hmm. or wherever she's spending most of her time. Yeah, pop culture. Has basically right. set the vocabulary and the perception of how she should understand herself. And I think the saddest thing about seeing this promoted is we know that people that follow this path, suicide rates are higher, right. depression rates are higher, anxiety is higher. That's why it's almost unconscionable to me that not only do we have people in this country pushing kids further and further that direction, putting experimental drugs in them, telling them that they're something that they're not. We have Catholic priests. We have priests inside our own church encouraging this kind of lifestyle. And so yeah. to see such charity from this grandmother, it, it no matter how she read that letter, there's no way to read that letter in which it seems like she was angry or she was upset. It just seemed like she genuinely wanted what's best. And like, I wish every grandma was like, yeah. if every grandma was like that. I, I kind of, <laughs> you know, I want someone like that. I do. I'm fortunate I have a great family. I don't want to say like I don't. But um, yeah, it, it just, she is responding in charity. I know she can't see that right now, but I think hopefully five, 10 years down the road. I mean, when I was a kid, psh, like some of the things my parents said I thought were dumb, but now I'm like, wow, there's so much wisdom. Or I didn't realize their sacrifice. Kid, was that like last week? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, last week. Last week when um, I was mad at my mom for putting me in timeout. 
Yeah, I turned I turned uh, <laughs> I turned the the big two five. It may look oh, like I turned eighteen. Quarter but... century. Oh, look yeah, at you. Quarter century. Oh. My brain is fully developed. I'm pumped on that. Hey, like you have frontal prime. lobes, Pogo. That's right. Congratulations. Uh, so if I, if I sound more intelligent on the podcast, yeah, it's all just age. It's yeah, all just biology. that's great. <laughs> Which I could couldn't use. be the company you keep. <laughs> <laughs> could be my two wonderful co-hosts. Ah, so shucks. Um, yeah, man, that was a heavy. That was a heavy video, but I think that we also at the loop definitely get accused of like, why do you only cover sad stuff? Why do you only cover sad stuff? And our colleague, Stephen, brings this up all the time. It's like, you can find so much beauty and hope in painful things mm -hmm. and in hard things. And I think this is the perfect example, right? Yeah. I mean, she doesn't see it, but she has someone in her corner, like praying her hands <laughs> off for this girl. And like, she'll benefit from that yeah. one day. Yep. So, and that's what it's about. Like, right. it's the front lines. Right. And this is know? what we're called to do. For pe even people we don't know, even for this girl, like we can pray for this girl. I know. But See, first, how many Loopcast family, listeners right? are just saying a Hail Mary for this girl right now? Like there is so much grace being just poured on this poor girl and her grandmother. Yeah. And uh, hey, we're on the winning side, y'all. Like this is going to be, this is going to be great, great for this girl. So thank you all for praying for her. Yeah. Hey guys, Tom here. Quick break from the episode. Some things that you can do to really help us out. One, leave us a review. Specifically on Apple Podcasts, it helps a lot. If you go down, give us five stars, write a nice review, helps boost us in algorithms. Really appreciate it. You can also leave us five stars on Spotify. Two, go over to YouTube, hit subscribe. We put all kinds of good content there. We're really trying to grow the channel. So if you enjoy what we put out here, you'll see some other things as well. Go ahead and hit subscribe and then leave a comment actually on this episode. Uh, I'll be able to see what you say. Love interacting with you. Uh, it helps boost us as well. Three, if you want to keep our mics on, you want to keep us going. You can actually donate to Catholic Vote at catholicvote.org slash champions. Support us so that we can keep doing this and other projects uh, for you. All right. That being said, uh, we need some time to cleanse from politics conversations. And therefore, we have the season of Lent upon us. I know I very much enjoyed my Fat Tuesday. I found a punchki in a punchki desert. I didn't think they existed for the past three years in Indianapolis. And I did indeed find them. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. It's impressive. Uh, it's important to the Polish heritage that I don't have, but I have by marriage. And uh, I do love me some punchkis. So now that Fat Tuesday's out of the way, we're into Lent. Uh, what are we doing for Lent this year? Do you have any thoughts on how we can maximize it, how you're planning on maximizing it for your families? What's going on? Well, we are, as usual, I'm that Catholic mom who's like, okay, kids, everybody line up at the table. This is what you're giving up for Lent. <laughs> so yeah, we definitely have some family That's practices. Relatable. And I try and, I try and you know, adjust it every year uh, based on the kids' ages and their needs. So we have, you know, for our family night prayer, I'll switch up which, which hymns we're going to be singing together to really teach them some of the, the treasury of the church's hymnody that's reflective on the 40 days a little you bit more. You guys sing hymns at night? We do. We, we do. Awesome. We say a decade of the rosary or we do Compline, depending on how much energy we have. Compline takes a lot more energy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Because the kids fight over, like, who's going to be the lector and who's going to be the leader. <laughs> and the rosary is easier. Yeah. You just, like, dole out the Hail Marys. But so, yeah, right. we, we do that. And then we, we usually sing a hymn because we want our kids to, like, know the songs of the church and the joy of, of music and all that. I'm not, like, a great mm -hmm. singer myself, so don't listen, but within That's your cool. family, it's cool. So yeah, we'll switch that up. And I always try and pick up a little spiritual reading this year in honor of Pope Benedict XVI. I'm going to work my way through um, Jesus of Nazareth again. So yeah. the, the Holy Week volume. So I'm looking forward to that. I haven't read it since it first came out. I've had a few kids since then. Life has changed. So I'm sure I'll find something new to, to speak to me. So yeah, yeah, what do you guys do, Josh? You have six kids. You line them up and make them eat beans and rice all in. <laughs> wear, wear hair shirts. Hair shirts. Their parents would be listening to me sing. Oh, I, I mean... there you go. <laughs> Dad will sing to you a lullaby every night of Lent. <laughs> Obviously, we do the traditional Catholic thing where you give something up for Lent. Um, I, I think that's important to start with. And then I, I try to also make sure that we're doing something in addition you know, obviously spiritual. So, you know, we kick up extra prayers like, Hey guys, you know, let's, let's do this. Let's pray. And my little Elizabeth, she's our great intercessor and, and she likes to, 
She's got like a list now. She's only seven, but her list is like 40 long. And we're going to pray for, for Tony. And it's like, I, Who's Tony? Gonna, I might mention it. What? I don't even know. We mentioned it. Someone who needs prayers like offhanded like 30 days ago as she remembers it. God bless her heart. Aww. She's got such a beautiful little soul. Um, hopefully that, that spirit doesn't get crushed by living with a, you know, crusty old dad like me, but <laughs> it's actually very sweet to see. Yeah. For me, uh, I just actually have, a, have started the whole new year of trying to eat well and eat and be ready. I think this is, it's not like I want to lose weight, but it's like understanding that I want to be the best dad and hopefully grandpa, when my children start getting old enough to leave the house and have kids. And it's understanding that God gave you a great gift in your body and it's a temple that you need to take care of. And so, um, that's not really uh, just because it's Lent, but it's just starting to have an understanding of, cause it's easy to get like, oh, you know, the sins or whatever. It's like, you know what, like gluttony is a sort of a forgotten sin. That's one I've, I have perhaps indulged in a little bit too much. So, yeah, you know, it's just trying to look at what, you know, your every day, every way, what you could be doing better and try to just root out sin, ways that you're going to disappoint the Lord. Yeah. You know, try to and do I that. think like ways of rooting it out, I definitely struggle in our job. We're obviously on social media all the time, but I find it a struggle when I'm outside of work hours to tune down the social media then because I find that I'm going back and checking and checking and checking. And so for Lent, just setting some like serious parameters on the hours that I'm checking social media and trying to get a handle on what's necessary for the work that we do and what's just me indulging in escapism. Yeah. So that's it's a big a goal line. this Lent for sure. It is. It's a tough line, especially tough in our line, line of work, right? Yeah. What about you, I think Pogo? Too, what's oh, going geez. on? What's going on with Pogo? I'm on the hot seat. Well, so it's funny. I was talking to someone about, you know, what are we doing for Lent? And I, when I think of Lent, I think of uh, traditionally like the three pillars would be mm -hmm. uh, something spiritual, uh, giving something up. Uh, that's like a, a physical uh, comfort and then also like almsgiving. And I don't know, I feel like almsgiving kind of gets forgotten. You know, I make my contributions to uh, my parish, uh, which I love dearly. But I'm trying to think of a creative way to kind of outside of that, on top of that, try to contribute to someone who needs something. And I, I need to give more thought of that. But just a, a financial sacrifice. I feel like when I talk to my Protestant friends they're humongous like the evangelicals are like man they'll give the shirt off their back and i want to kind of get in touch with that spirit of just generosity and want to help so uh I've, I've been thinking a lot about that and then in regards to giving something up physical like a physical pleasure that often gets talked down on and yes i know it's cliche to give up chocolate or whatever <laughs> and someone's like well if i give it up i'm just going to eat it again in three months or whenever. So what's the point of giving it up? And I was like, well, it's kind of missing the point. Like the point is, is that you're uh, willingly denying yourself a pleasure. And then you could kind of connect that very small suffering to suffering of Christ, the great, greater prepare yourself no, I, for the whole I time. 100%, 100%. Agree with that. And so I, I don't, I don't, I, want to be I, don't, the first I hate say, the whole downplaying yeah, of don't it. Don't downplay it. Like it's, you are sacrificing. It's not, nothing. Like, it's not nothing. It's you're kind of conditioning yourself to give up small pleasures. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminds me of like why I brought the hair shirt kind of as a joke. Well, legitimately, monk, there are monks out there that wear hair shirts. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, what is that really gaining them? They're not really bettering themselves, quote unquote, by wearing a hair shirt. Like their suffering is a reminder of the suffering of Christ, therefore bringing you closer. And so, I think we are bettering. Yeah. I think that by, you know, accepting suffering and choosing a certain penance, we actually are in a way becoming better ourselves because are as first world really wealthy americans i mean no one in history has lived in so much comfort as us it it starts we are deceived into thinking that we're in control and these are the things that make us happy that fill all the voids in our life and when we strip them away it's this opportunity to see that they weren't really filling us up anyway in the first place that only only the love of god suffices to fill that hole and it's really important to take away some of our physical comforts, given yeah. how comfortable we are from day to day. Like I could just walk to the grocery store and buy whatever I want for dinner every time. Yeah. Because I accept <laughs> chicken sometimes because of the supply chains. But for the yeah. most part, as an American, I have this unlimited choice. Middle class American. Middle class yeah. American. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm not even top of the line, right? But right. Um, yeah. 
But even I think if, if it's I really could, I, I want to go back to that, like the the penis thing. I mm-hmm. I agree with you, Tom. That too many people downplay it. And I don't think we should. So, okay, I, this might sound like tiny in a sense, but my friend Jason Jones said we should do something where we sacrifice something for the unborn. And this is about ten years ago. And so he gave up coffee. He wasn't going to have any coffee until Roe v. Wade got overturned. I thought that was pretty impressive. I was not that ambitious. I just said, okay, I'm not going to eat Butterfinger candy bars, which is my favorite. And I didn't for like 10 years. And then Roe v. Wade gets overturned. And my mom sent me a box of like 12. And I, I don't think I got through a week. Yeah. I mean, they were so delicious. I hadn't tasted them forever. And then, unfortunately, the people in my state of Michigan went whole hog yeah, for abortion yeah. and voted for uh, abortion into the Constitution. So I, I thought about that. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to continue to have desserts to celebrate the birthdays of my children, my wife, myself. But other than that, I don't need desserts. I'm going to offer it up. That's awesome. It's just a simple thing to do. Yeah. yeah. I think... Uh, to the idea of offering something up, obviously a uniquely Catholic idea, but really a beautiful opportunity, especially people think about it extra in Lent, but really you can do it anytime. I think that for Lent this year, uh, as a competitive person, and I think especially in the line of work, as Erica was saying, you know, we often draw battle lines and think of our enemies and we talk in very like my team, their team type terms. And Jesus does call us to pray for our enemies, not necessarily to stop, you know, pursuing truth or doing what you know is right, but to pray very intentionally for your enemies. So I want to give up something. Care for their soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. For their soul. So so I I do want to give up some physical, I am going to be giving up some physical comforts this Lent. And I think specifically I'm going to give it up with the intention of do it for people that, you know, I would consider my enemies because really like we want everyone to get to heaven, right? We need to pray for the salvation of souls and, uh, so it's just a good reminder. I think especially, you know, we're Catholics who are doing a podcast on politics, which is, I don't think it was really out there outside of here. And so uh, this is a kind of a unique opportunity, I think, for us and for our little community here at the Loopcast, people listening, we appreciate you so much, to offer that up for the challenges we see ahead of us and for, for our neighbors, really, our brothers and sisters. So um, at this opportunity as well, if you're on YouTube, uh, drop in the comments, what are you giving up this year? Uh, I, I read them all. If you want to send it to the inbox, I'd be happy to talk to you. Info at catholicvote.org. Uh, let us know what you're doing for Lent. And uh, I want to see what, if there's any creative ones to come up with. Maybe I'll be able to mention it next week. But uh, yeah, we're praying for you guys. We're in it with you for sure. It's just a Catholic thing to do, huh? So In it to win it this Lent. That's right. Absolutely. Bring it on. Love in it. it. To win it. Love it. So that being said, we move into the Twilight Zone. So we have uh, a reporter at the Washington Post. Uh, democracy and dies in darkness. You may recognize it. Uh, kind of former, highly esteemed organization, kind of a propaganda rag at this point. But I thought this was really funny because last week we actually talked about the Twilight yeah, Zone. Amazon rag. <laughs> right. Owned by Amazon, owned by a billionaire. Um, we talked about last week about this CDC report about how youth in the country, especially, are just extra depressed, extra anxious, specifically young girls, which is really. Uh, disturbing to me uh, that the youth of our country are just feeling so hopeless. And so most people attribute it to a lot of things, but I think top of the list were probably technology of some kind, social media, phones. I mean, the access that we have without any type of safeguards is pretty unbelievable at this point. I think really contribute. So, uh, and the Taylor, studies have shown that studies have shown stu- that correct conclusively Sorry, it's not just, that causes right. it. It's not yeah. just speculation, y'all. <laughs> it's not speculation. There's a lot of science to back that up. But Taylor, who I got to respect, went a different route, and so uh, I got to read what she had to say about the matter. So, and this is uh, can you I read it in like, her voice? Can you like give it a voice or something? I don't think I okay. could. All right, all right. <laughs> there's a whole JK. there's a whole thing about her being in her forties. Mm. and trying to act like she's young and hip because she covers social media. So I'm going to read it, and the grammar isn't great, but people are like, why are kids so depressed? It must be their phones. But never mention the fact that we're living in a late-stage capitalist hellscape during an ongoing deadly pandemic with record wealth inequality, zero social safety net, slash job security, as climate change cooks the world. 
not to be a doomer. And I appreciate the fact that she had to bring us up there. Not to be a doomer. She's not a doomer. But you have to be delusional to look at life in our country right now and have any amount of hope or optimism. All the people yelling that capitalism actually is going great and everyone in the U.S. should be cheerful and happy. If you're so content with your life, then what are you doing on here getting all worked up? I mean, to extend oh, I'm Taylor. I feel kind of frustrated and don't have optimism is that people like you have platforms like you do. <laughs> I mean, she's absolutely no, no. everything that's wrong no, with this one, country. One step further, people like her have platforms that they do because of the capitalist system. <laughs> like, let's just keep no, going she, down that road. She'd be employed just, by the communist government to spread propaganda. I mean, she, she does actually it would be like, a very good job. propagandist for She'd Soviet okay. Russia. They would have right. really used her well. I just want to bring her to my house for like five days and make her <laughs> just hang out with my kids all over her. Like, you don't have to be optimistic. You can think that the country is going to no, hell. That would be a reality show I'd watch. Effect. Yes. <laughs> Taylor Lorenz visits the Ahern house. It would be awesome. She could Taylor, sing hymns Taylor, I'm you inviting guys. you. She could sing hymns. Oh, man. Yeah, I wonder if she's I got a good voice. I would love to see your live tweet that experience. So, Taylor, I think you need a hug. You need uh, a hug. If you need and it. You need a hug Erica from, Erica like, lives in happy... Connecticut. I know. Just drive over. You probably visit here all the time to see the yachts in the island. Yeah. I don't have a yacht. But you can yeah, come yeah. hang out. I'll grill you a hamburger when it's not Lent anymore. Uh, Erica, which I was on this week. Oh, man. Well, speaking of grumpy older women, I was just reading in the, <laughs> in the Washington Examiner, we had a, a group of rainbow mask-wearing women denied communion at Denver Area Catholic Church. And this is, uh, yeah, you know, people like Archbishop Cor Cordiglione, who... Almost a year ago now, he told Nancy Pelosi not to present herself at Holy Communion. Uh, she had separated for herself from the church. And he was all accused of politicizing the Eucharist. And how dare you use the Eucharist as a, as a baton to beat poor Pelosi with? Well, now these women show up uh, wearing gay pride-themed masks to mass. And when they presented themselves to the, the priest, he just waved them on as, you know, most of us have probably been at masses where... Hopefully you've seen, you know, a priest do that in a very loving way, not in an angry way. Um, but then they then they went to the press with it, and it's all over the local newspaper. The local news covered it, and they're all like, "We're the victims, and we didn't mean anything. We just showed up to show support for this former teacher at the All Saints Catholic School who had been fired because she had entered publicly into a same-sex relationship." violating the contract she had signed with the school and they're like we were just showing our solidarity for her and we just we weren't politicizing it and this priest politicized it it's just the ultimate gaslighting the priest was just upholding the teaching of the catholic church kudos to him and shame on these women for going to mass wearing masks that mean something and don't tell me okay. that we were just showing up yeah but our church really needs to do a better job. Like the priests, I'm not going to pick on this one priest in particular, okay? But if we had Catholic priests on a routine basis explaining what it means to be a man and a woman and what the church has an understanding of human sexuality and all this stuff, instead of letting the culture teach the flock and then all the kids in school like, oh, Mrs. So-and-so is so nice. And then why are they firing her? What? And no one has any any clue because none of these kids have been exposed to Catholic teaching right. on what it means. And so that's my, I think, my frustration with this. Like, did the priest in this case do the right thing? Yes. However, if that's all we do is the bare minimum, it drives me sort of crazy. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, like, well, why don't bishops do more? Why don't priests do more? Like, well, I wrote it and I wrote a little column about it and I put it in the bulletin. Or the bishops were like, well, we sent a press release out about oh, it. Oh, yeah, like, press it's releases. not enough. We wrote a letter. Like, the culture is pounding it on these issues. Mm -hmm. And every media outlet, every entertainment show ever, and it's like, don't you understand? Like, what's going on? Why aren't you responding in kind? It's just it's just sort okay, of amazing but really, to me. Josh, so. Josh you, shouldn't need, you shouldn't need to defend yourself for people who are openly politicizing, like, Jesus Christ in... In the Eucharist, right? If Look, someone showed at up at this moment, I'm Josh, obviously very proud of the priest. If someone showed up out. in a clan hood, that. Josh, if someone showed up in a clan hood, no one would need an explanation. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't. 
If and someone think, showed up in a swastika, they wouldn't. It, Josh's okay. point. But the th- I think Josh's point, though. What's the thing? Is that it's very clear with the Klan to people because they've been educated about what that right. means. 99% of Catholics are against, 99.99% of Catholics are against the Klan or against neo-Nazi stuff. You know, that's been, that lesson has been told from the pulpit and and in all the media, there's no disagreement here. Mm-hmm. The question then is with the LGBTQ question, right? So that's that that's a question that's being presented to us currently. And there's a division in the church. Look at the numbers. Like people are like, what do Catholics think about, you know, same sex marriage, right? And it's not ninety nine to no, zero. It reflects or the culture. Right. Percent to one. And you're saying so, it should be in an ideal world, ninety nine to zero. Absolutely. I'm saying that, per- yeah, the percentage of Catholics who believe that marriage should be just between a man and a woman should be landslide numbers. It should be ninety nine percent. Why wouldn't it be? Right. So I, I mean, think the Josh, story. That's the it I think be. the story the, here, though, is that this priest who rightfully who did the right thing in the moment at that communion line. He should not in any way be an abnormality because, I mean, I'll be frank, in Connecticut here in the Northeast, you can, it is easier to find a parish where you could wear a rainbow mask with absolutely no, no ramifications, right? No one would say anything. People would give you big hugs probably. It's harder to find a parish where you might even be looked at sideways for wearing the rainbow mask, right, in the, in the mask. And that shouldn't. Yeah, they probably have more of an objection if you were an American flag man. But I just think that. But the the difference here is that these women said they did it as a protest in solidarity for the teacher. Correct. So so that's the difference to me. Like if you're just wearing it and you're wearing it and nothing's going on, but like they intentionally stuck it in the face of the priest and said, "I disagree with your Mm -hmm. decision, and therefore I'm going to wear this." So. I just think any yeah, type Tom, of political demonstration like that, it's just like why there shouldn't... Of course. My, my point is, you know, like, yes, thank you for doing that. Thank you for saying that these women shouldn't receive communion. They shouldn't politicize it. I'm, I'm all for that. That's good. There's people I'm that disagree saying, with that, though, is what I'm saying. Of course. Well, I think they're crazy. <laughs> yeah. But my point is, we as a church, you know, we need to raise the bar up a little mm-hmm. bit. You know, it can't be that our only encounters with this is like... Why did you fire this teacher that everyone loves? Like the, it's in a sense we we win that little battle, but we're losing the war. That's what I'm trying to get. Yeah, at. and I do think the coverage of this was lacking in that respect. And we've talked about this before that Catholics need to start to change the perception in the culture that the Catholic Church has this set of rules, and if we break them, we can just say, oh, you broke our rules, and so we should have a carve out. Or we broke our rules, so now you have to leave teaching at our school. We have to restate it in terms of the, the positive, a complete human anthropology that's, that's inviting. And Helen Alvary does this phenomenally in her book, Religious Freedom After the Sexual Revolution, that the coverage of this, even from the Catholic side, was very much, well, the church states like, and it's always the church, like the church hierarchy states that homosexual acts are sinful and intrinsically disordered. So the school was within its rights to fire the teacher. Therefore, we're obligated Therefore, to do X. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like we had to do it because they made us do it because we're Catholic. Yeah. And that cannot okay. be the message. I get it. Yeah, I think right. that's that's clear. That's what I'm getting. But you yeah, also should not kind of weaponize me. the Eucharist in that way. It's disgusting. No one should yeah, do I, that who believes I think in the true that presence. was more just a visceral reaction to me of someone trying to put yeah, sure. Him. I mean, he's but your he point was, is more of a of Calgary. You don't need to do this, right? Exactly. So I that just really made me sick, and that's just okay, like all things put aside. Like, go receive the Eucharist to receive the Eucharist, and not to make statements. Like, it's because we need the grace. Just oh, we that, need the grace. The lowest Amen. form of trickery going on there. It's like, please target something else. Like, terrible. So, uh, Josh, moving on. Your twilight zone. Well, so my twilight zone. I mean, I'm gonna combine a little bit of uh, a viewer mail. That's here. right, viewer Are you mail. With me on this one. I'm with you. So, we had uh, some people that were a little frustrated in uh, yeah, yeah, about some of the articles we put in the loop lately. Um, someone named Paul M, which is actually oh Paul, uh, not yeah. my dad. I promise. Uh, he <laughs> that would he be said, funny though. That would, that be, would really be really funny, funny if it was your dad. <laughs> Your promotion of Dr. Jan Smith and her attempt to shove the Latin mass down everyone's throat is precisely the criticism I gave in my survey comments. 
If you continue to promote the Latin Mass at the expense of the Contemporary Mass, I will be canceling. Catholic vote from my email, despite my support for your conservative moral stances. Well, I mean, I am thankful, Paul, that you sent that in. Um, I We welcome feedback. Um, but it's interesting that he said this because we get another mail uh, email come in from Anthony. Uh, and he said, I'm an avid reader of The Loop and enjoy the podcast. It's a highlight of my week. Uh, thank you for the great work your organization is doing. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. He said, I've recently heard rumors, both anecdotally and echoed online, about a possible restrictions coming down this Lent on the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, I have not been able to find anything but speculation. Uh, I worry these concerns are not unfounded. Uh, so these guys are, since your organization is very connected with prominent Catholic leaders, are you aware of any credible information about additional restrictions? So, you know, Anthony, it's kind of interesting. We've got two different sides of the coin here. Um, I just want to, for it, when he sends that email, and then a few days later, what happens? Yeah. The Vatican drops the ax and puts further restrictions on the Latin Mass. And I just want to explain, you know, my perspective on all this, uh, especially to Paul, who is critical of us. I actually don't go to the Latin Mass. Um, I've been maybe six times in my entire life. I love it, actually. I think it's very beautiful. Same here, yeah. But it's, I, I normally go uh, to the Norvis Ordo Mass, um, and I think it's mostly mediocre um, at its best. Uh, I'm not a big fan. Uh, but I live in a very rural area. Getting to the Latin Mass is not, is not actually easy for my family. Uh, others do it, you know, they're, they're better than I am, I guess. But the thing I've always noticed over the last 30 years in the church is that I grew up in, in the 1980s and everything was just bland, mediocre. The songs were all sappy and crappy. And I have always described the mass, you know, as basically cold oatmeal. It, it's just run down, watery, terrible. I guess you can survive on it, but it doesn't do much for the soul. Uh, obviously, the Eucharist at the Mass mm -hmm. is uh, everything you need, uh, uh, but I'm saying everything else around it. And people have said, well, why, would that, why should that matter? You should be able to worship Jesus in a sewer. It's like, yeah, I should be able to. But in this fallen world, I'd be like, why is it dark? Why does it smell? I hate this. This is crazy. And people would be screaming crazy. It's like, we don't have to worship in a sewer. We can actually worship in a beautiful building and have music that's uplifting mm -hmm. to God and architecture that edifies the soul. And, you know, actually liturgy that's wonderful. And it can be in English. My goodness. Yes, of course. I've seen it done, mm -hmm. you know, especially where you're at, New Haven. Yeah, I, very I've blessed. seen it done very beautifully. But so, but I have noticed over the 30 years, uh, my adult life here as a Catholic, um, the institution, so many people in the institutional church have such a visceral reaction, negative reaction to people who like the Latin Mass. And I'm not one who does. Like I say, I don't do go to the Latin Mass. But I am disgusted on their behalf at how they get treated. Like, yeah. right. why? It's like, j let these people go to the Latin Mass. Like, it's always the Catholic lefties, like the America types or whatever. That that preach tolerance and want to beat us over the head with tolerance all day long, and they're and they see someone going to Latin Mass and they want to pull out a bazooka. Right. Like, Calm down, bro. Like, what is the yeah. problem? And so Pope Francis is right at the top of the list. He's just like he he has such a visceral negative reaction to people who celebrate the the Latin Mass, and he has a visceral reaction against American Catholics. He thinks we're all like you know right wing fascists from Chile or Argentina or whatever. It's like Mm -hmm. Bro, wake up! You, I just yeah, and it's, it's just really I think it's really hard to swallow too. It's a twilight zone. Yeah, it's total no. twilight zone. When you see these videos coming out of masses from, say, Germany, for example, or oh my gosh, Spain, yeah. there was a recent like puppet mass that we were we were handing around the the or the the Slack channel, and people are like, "Whoa, what's going on?" And so you're thinking, "Okay, we're having the and they never drop the hammer on those, right? Do they? Where's no. the hammer on those? Where is it?" Oh, well, only the Vatican can approve puppet masses because the bishops obviously <laughs> d aren't, don't have this under control because there's, there's right. no quality puppet control mass. on that stuff. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, why are we saying like a bishop no longer has the right to decide which of his priests can say the traditional Latin mass? 
That's just, it's super heavy handed from the Vatican. It is so the opposite of synodality, if you will, you know, pardon the expression. It's It's the opposite. Right. So it's Mm -hmm. synodality for Germans and German heretics, but not for people who just want to worship. Conformity for American Catholics. They just want to worship in the old mass. Yeah, and and it's just, I guess it's frustrating when we bring forth news in the loop. We try to keep people informed about what's going on in the country, in the church, bring you up a little bit with some beautiful images. If a major debate in today's church is over the treatment of the traditional Latin mass, by us covering that, that's by no means like an Mm -hmm. endorsement as this is the only mass that anyone can go to. It's us covering a very real and relevant debate right now. So. And look, if we if we read an article like it doesn't if it has a good cogent argument for something that Catholics can genuinely disagree over, we're going to share that because it's part of, you know, civil discourse is super important within the church and within the country. And we want to be part of that at the loop. Totally. It's been a part of the church's heritage for 15 centuries. (laughs) It would be normal for a Catholic organization to kind of mention it affectionately every you know, a few weeks yeah, or months or so. Like all those saints so we I don't love. understand. <laughs> I don't understand why that's so crazy. Yeah. And I guess too, if we, it, we're doing our job, if we're doing something that makes people talk and makes people debate and makes people think, right? We're trying to get food for thought. And the fact that this has gotten such a reaction from us is like probably indication that, you know, we're covering something that matters, right? That, that people actually care about. Over so, the target. Yeah. Over the target. Yeah. We're going to be continuing to... Yeah, we matters, may not get right? it right every time, but pray yeah. for us. You know? yeah, pray for please. us. We're, we're available too. We're trying our best. So, and that does us for this episode of the Loopcast. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we've experienced some really just, uh, it's, it's shocking to me, but just awesome growth. So if you're new to this little Loopcast community here, uh, we'd really appreciate if you leave us a review, specifically on Apple Podcasts, uh, subscribe to our YouTube. Uh, we really appreciate it. It helps us reach more people and make sure that you're getting each episode uh, with each new episode. Also, I love hearing from you. I mention often, I do go through the inbox. If you'd he like to email me. He reads them all. Me, he I reads read every single one. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. We read some of the mail. Yeah. On the, That's on right. The we had a little <laughs> mail on the cast today. So that inbox is loopcast at catholicvote.org. Love to hear from you. And uh, we're praying for you guys. And we'll see you on the next one. Take care, guys. <laughs>